I ministered last Sunday on um, Jesus and generosity, and that was the first Sunday of the year that I've done that. I, I typically take about five Sundays. I typically take about the tithe of the year. It's 52 weeks. I take about five weeks out of the year and talk about biblical generosity. And to teach you out of the Word of God, um, because we, we want you to have God in your finances. How many of you want God to bless the work of your hand and, and bless your business? How many of you want God to bless your businesses? Amen. Yeah. But not just with money. Um, when, when the Bible talks about the blessings of the Lord um, and true riches, it's so much more than money. Um, I always tell people, when you get someone's money, you get the cheapest part of them. Um, they made the money. The money didn't make them. Amen? And uh, heaven, heaven is paved with gold. It's, 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 it's not about that. It's, we want God's blessings on our health. How many of you know the older you get, health means more than money? <laughs> Wish that somebody who... I'm, I'm realizing at 45... Okay, let's just be able to see today. What's that worth? Come on, can I get an amen about that? You know, uh, I've been talking about, and I appreciate everybody praying for my little sister, Audrey. We have her, her children with us right now. We have 12 children at the house. And she's 38, was diagnosed with breast cancer. You know, you, you think you, 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 don't, you never face sickness till you're old. That's not true. You don't know what's around the corner. You don't know what's happening in your body. You know, that's why you better pray over your body. Somebody say amen about that every day. That's why every time we come to church, we rebuke sickness. We rebuke cancer. We rebuke disease. Come on, can you get an amen about that? You're not going to go wrong praying healing over your body. And so, um, you know, you don't, you don't know that, but the older you get, you begin to realize health is worth more than gold. You know, a, a wife or a husband who loves you is worth more than treasure. Children who respect you and love Jesus is true riches. Can I get an amen about that? And you begin to realize, you know, these are the things that are, are worth more than, than money. And I want to talk to you today about the blessings of the Lord. And I want to challenge some of your theology today, possibly, and, and really minister to you. So, Lord, anoint me to minister your word today. Let our hearts be open. Everybody say, Lord, let my heart be open to receive in Jesus' name. Um, you know, earth is preparing for war, but heaven's preparing for a wedding. And if you want Jesus to teach you, you have to come to Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew 5, we've been dealing with the, the Sermon on the Mount, that his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them. I feel the Holy Spirit in here. And prayer is not just a discipline. Prayer is a privilege. It's a privilege to talk to Jesus. And if Satan can get you to pick up a lie of unforgiveness... You'll lose your ability to connect to the Lord. And you've heard me say it before, a lot of us, the reason we can't forgive people is because we think we're better disciplinary than the Lord. The great sin of presumption, you know. I, I really want to challenge, I, I spoke about that a few weeks ago. I really want to challenge all of us to, to keep that in your heart. David called it the great sin of presumption. Everybody say, Jesus, free me from the great sin of presumption. The great sin of presumption is you presuming to know what's in someone else's heart. Social media really makes that bad because you see somebody post something and you think you know what's in their heart or you see somebody not post something and you, you presume to know their heart. This is wickedness. And, and every time you do it, ask the Lord, say, God, challenge me on that. Don't let me be a person who's more aware of the sins and flaws of others 
than I am my own flaws. That's what keeps you humble, is knowing what's wrong with you. Come on, can you get any men about it? We, we're, we're so busy looking at how much other people weigh that we don't ever want to get on the scale ourselves. But this is what God told Adam in Genesis. He says, Adam, where are you? The Lord is very intentional with us looking at ourselves. God, what's going on with me? And I wish we hated our own sins as much as we hate the sins of others. You know? I've seen people walk away from people because of their sins. They, they hate other people's sins more than they hate their own. Other people's sins will not keep you out of heaven. Your sins will keep you out of heaven. And anytime I talk about finances, you know, there's always somebody going, are you a prosperity preacher? Let me answer the question for you. I am not through the lens of believing prosperity is the gospel. It's not the gospel. Because I don't think you can preach it everywhere. I don't think you can preach prosperity in the prison. But you can preach Jesus. I don't think you can go to certain parts of the world that are in poverty and preach prosperity. But you can preach Jesus. And if it's not the gospel everywhere, it's not the gospel anywhere. But when it comes to prosperity, I want to define it for you. And I want you to know what we mean when we talk about prosperity. And there's three things to it. Number one, you have no financial debt. Two, you have more than enough to fulfill every divine assignment God has for you. How many of you want to have enough to fulfill every divine assignment God has for you in your life? Right? And third, the last one, is that you have enough left over to help other people fulfill theirs. How many of you would love to be able to help other people fulfill their divine assignment? That's what it means to prosper. So we're not talking about having a certain item or a certain thing or something like that. But it's that, you know, God, I'm no longer a slave to debt. Because the Bible says the borrower is slave to the lender. As long as you owe people, you are in slavery. According to the word of God. And God does not want you to be a slave. He wants you to be free. Somebody say amen about that. And think about how cruel God would have to be to give us visions and gifts and talents and dreams and passions and callings. How many believe God's given us all that? Dreams and visions and passions and callings. How many, people, how many people God's given you some of those things? Raise your hand if God's given you dreams and gifts and talents and passions and callings. Wouldn't it be cruel for God to give you all of that but then pull back the provision and let you flounder and not be able to move forward in those things? God has a plan for you. And Christians are not, um, well, let me say it like this. Christians are to seek vision, not provision. Seek vision. Everybody say, God, give me vision. Give me vision. Give me vision. Speak to me. The disease that Jesus healed more than any other in the Bible was blindness. And every time he healed a man, he sent him home. Because a blessed man always produces a blessed house. God, heal my vision that I may see. This is one of the beautiful things that come when you spend time with Jesus is he begins to give you dreams and visions. And you begin to see things that you used to never be able to see. You begin to see things in people that you used to never be able to see. You begin to have a greater discernment. How many of you want to have a greater discernment? How many of you have made bad decisions and looking back go, man, I wish I'd have known what I know now. This is why you need the Lord. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, lean not to your own understanding. 
but in all thy ways acknowledge him that he may direct your path. So God, give me vision. I need it. And Christians, we don't, we don't chase dollars. And here's the good news of the kingdom. Wealth is attracted, not pursued. Right. Write that down. Yeah. Wealth is attracted, not pursued. The kingdom attracts what the world pursues. He is my magnet. And we do kingdom finances. Everybody say kingdom finances. And as long as your finances are under God and his authority, wealth is attracted to your life. And when it's all about you, Proverbs says money grows wings and flies away. And prosperity doesn't mean every Christian is going to be a billionaire. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, Or that money is just going, going to appear I always tell my children, don't ask God for money, ask God for a plan. Ask God for wisdom. If when you pray for money, God gives you money, I need to see you immediately after the service. (laughs) But every time I ask God for money, he never gives me money. You know what? He gives me a plan. Gives me a strategy. Gives me an idea. You know what the people on Shark Tank have that you don't have? An idea. They didn't walk in there with money. They walked in there with an idea. They walked out with money because they just had an idea. They had a plan. God, give me a plan. Everybody say, God, give me a plan. God, give me an idea. God, give me an idea. Yeah. The genius of God. How many people have ever watched Shark Tank and you sit there and you go, why didn't I think of that? Come on, has anybody else ever been there? Or you're walking through the store and you see some item and you think, my Lord, why didn't I? Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, the genius of God. This is the Lord. A lot of Christians are just waiting for mailbox money. But the Bible says that God would bless the works of your hand. Not your butt on the couch. Come on, amen about it. God's going to bless the work of your hand. And if you're waiting for the lottery, you know... You're you're never going to have a kingdom mentality. God wants to strengthen your kingdom muscles so you can carry weight into your assignment without it crushing you. Because he's more concerned about who you are becoming than the size of your bank account. Money's just a tool. Everybody say money's just a tool. And God wants us to have finances that are in proportion to your assignment. Amen. Amen. So good. Amen. Finances that are in proportion to your assignment. Amen? Because one day this life is going to pass and only what you do for Christ is going to count. It's not going to matter how much money you have. As a pastor, I'm with people when they die, and nobody says, you know, I wish I had more money. And no matter how rich or poor they are when they pass, nobody can write a check and get a minute. Only what you do for the Lord counts. And there's a day that's coming at the throne where we'll all stand before the Lord and give an account. You know, and right now it seems like, well, my walk with God, I don't know how much that matters. I don't know how much my prayer life matters. I don't know how close me being to Jesus matters, but there's going to come a day where that's going to be the only thing that matters. I, I promise you, hear me, there's going to be a day where the only thing that will matter is your closeness to Jesus. It's not just going to heaven. What your determ- what your relationship with Jesus now is determining your proximity to him for all of eternity. How many of you want to be close to Jesus for all of eternity? 
How many of you want to have access to the Lord for all of eternity? The closeness. Do you know what it is for God to call you his friend? Do you think it's do you think it would matter that everyone in heaven for all of eternity knew hey that's a friend of the king You think it does you think oh, it's not going to matter I promise you it's going to matter I promise you when you're in heaven it's going to matter your relationship to Jesus how close you are. You know who's closest to him in heaven for all of eternity? is martyrs. The Bible says that martyrs have a front row seat of the throne for all of eternity. I don't want to just be in heaven. I want to be close to Jesus. How many have ever been to an amazing, like some amazing event? You're like, man, we're all the way in the back. Some of you are always in the back because you get there late. But how many of you, how, how, many, how many of you, how many of you know that feeling of wishing you were closer? Anybody ever been in any environment where you just wished you were closer? Anybody, come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, you just felt like, man, I wish I was there. That, you don't want to feel like that in heaven. You want to be close. And who will be close are the people who are close now. Come on, Jesus. I want to be close to you. When you stand before him, you're not going to be wishing, oh, I wish I had this or I had that, or, you know, this was bigger on earth or that was bigger on earth. You're going to want to have a relationship with Jesus, not a bigger checking account or wish I had a bigger home or bigger that. Or you, it's, it's going to be about your relationship with him. Because everything we do in our flesh goes through the fire. Hay, wood, and stubble. Or it's gold, silver, and precious stones. Somebody say amen. amen. I want his blessings on my, my health. I want his blessings on my emotional health. Anybody else want that? Yes. So that means I'm going to stop complaining. Everybody say I'm going to stop complaining. Stop. Yeah. Pastor Ivan always says complaining is how you tell God you don't approve of how he's running your life. So, Lord, forgive me of complaining. Philippians 2, 14 and 15 says, if you don't complain, you will shine like the stars in the heavens. Wow. It's a big one, especially young people. Listen to me. Don't complain. Don't be a complainer. Learn to zip it, my mom would say. When someone else is complaining, just zip it. Pray. Change the atmosphere. Just love and be like Jesus. Amen? You know, the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. This is what the Bible talks about, an inheritance. Some of you want to leave an inheritance. A spiritual inheritance and a monetary inheritance. Anybody want to leave an inheritance? Yeah, this is what the Bible says. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children's children. Well, you're not going to be able to do that if you're broke. You know, leaving an inheritance is a godly thing. Lord, help me leave an inheritance to my children's children. It means you're going to have to have something that's invested to be able to pass down. And if you can't steward your finances, you can't be trusted to really shape the culture over cities. The Bible says he that doesn't take care of his own house is worse than an infidel. If you cannot take care of your own house, how, how can you take care of the household of faith? Yep. That's good. The vision of this church is not for you to have enough. Well, let me say it like this. The vision for this church is not for you to have on your tombstone. She paid her bills. It's for you to have more than enough to be able to do everything that God has called you to do and be able to help others do what God's called them to do. Amen. Yeah. 
How are you going to be able to do that? How are you going to be able to transform cities and influence nations if we just have just enough? We need El Shaddai. Everybody say El Shaddai. El Shaddai is more than enough. Everybody say more than enough. And in order to do that, you're going to need more money. And that means I'm going to have to be able to afford to go to the grocery store. How am I going to be able to impact the world and I can't buy groceries? He's El Shaddai. Everybody say El Shaddai. Yeah, El Shaddai, not El Cheapo. God doesn't mind meeting your needs in style or you having nice things or being comfortable or wonderful. God will bless you. Like he blessed a lot of us with good looks like me, just good looking people. Amen. God doesn't mind you having homes. But here's our, our money. But here's the question. How much money is too much money? How much money is too much money? Whatever amount of money replaces trusting God. Once you get to the point that you can't put God first, you've made too much money. And don't be, don't be jealous over what God gives other people. When you get jealous, that's a child who doesn't believe God has something for them. But if you knew God had something for you, you wouldn't care what God gave other people. There's, there's a poverty mentality is whatever I, whatever I don't have is what you don't need. Why do you need two cars? You only drive one at a time. Whoever said that only had one car. Why you need a, why you need a car? You could have a bicycle. Whoever said that didn't have a car. Why you need a bicycle when you could walk? Whoever said that didn't have a bicycle. Because whatever I have is what, whatever I don't have is what you don't need. You understand poverty mentality? And you can go all the way down. Why you got shoes? You don't need shoes. You, you understand? You can just keep going down and down and down and down and down and down. Well, that could have been sold and given to the poor. You know who coined that statement? How many of you ever heard that statement? That could have been sold and given to the poor. How many of you ever heard that statement? Raise your hand. You know who you're quoting when you say that? Judas. Just when you think of all the scriptures to know. <laughs> all the ones to have down in your heart and memorize. I don't know if Judas is the one you want to you have. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Trusting God. God, can I put you first in this amount of money? You know, for some people, they get $1,000 in their pocket and they forget there's a God in heaven. Other people, it could be $100 million. It wouldn't make a bit of difference because their heart is to put God first. And God is looking for people who love not the world so he can trust them with the world. I'm going to say that again. God is looking for people who love not the world so he can trust them with the world. I love putting people on stage who don't want to be on it. God is looking for Moseses who don't want to talk. Oh, come on, somebody say amen about it. God, God, God is looking for people who go, no, let, the pure of heart, the meek, the lowly. God's looking for those people that he can use. You know, I got, I got eight, they're all so different. I got kids, I don't care what we're doing. I got, I got, I got some that are making sure everybody else has before they eat. I got others who are like looking to go, well, okay, there's only so much of this. And then I see how many kids, so, okay, that's going to be two for every, for, like they're adding it up. <laughs> I got other ones who are like, well, if they're not going to have it, can I have it? You know, it, it's all of that is represented within them and as a dad I want to give I want to give to the more to the ones who are looking to give that's how God is come on come on can I get a big amen about that you know that's what God's looking for and and I grew up in in a denomination that was a little more poverty in some ways but 
you know, we'd hear these testimonies of missionaries. Man, we didn't have any food, and we prayed, and then we, we heard a knock at the door, and food showed up, and praise God. That was amazing. I don't know people believe God can do all that. Come on, that's amazing, right? But we also need people. We also need to hear the testimonies of, like, God raised somebody up to be a millionaire, and they just paid off somebody's house, or they just bought a building and funded and paid for millions of people. We need those testimonies, too. Come on, can I get an amen? We need that in the kingdom as well. We need all those stories. And there's been a lot of bad teaching on finances, for sure. But we still need finances. You know, there's been a lot of bad teaching on what to eat, but we're all eating this afternoon, too. Come on, can I get an amen about it? There's been a lot of bad teaching on heaven, but I still plan on going. Anybody else plan on going, even though somebody taught, you're like, well, I'm not going to heaven because somebody talked bad about it. What? I plan on going to heaven. And we'll find out who's right or wrong about certain things, but I'm going. So don't let error keep you from the truth. You know, don't, don't ignore truth because there's been error. Just the fact that there has been error tells you there's truth. I was in New York City a couple of years ago, and I was out front of the, we, you were walking down one of these famous streets, and there's all these stores, these high-end stores that sell these high-end products, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. And out front of the stores, there were the same bags and clothes on the sidewalk with a person with a piece of plastic down selling it. So you look in the window and you see a bag and then you look on the sidewalk and there's the same bag. And this one's $25,000 and this one's $25. And they look exactly the same, right? And the only reason there's a knockoff is because there's a genuine. Does that make sense to you? The very fact that there's a knockoff tells you there's a genuine. So, so you don't ignore, you, you don't walk away from truth just because there's something that's a knockoff. The very fact that there's a knockoff tells you there's truth. Amen? Is this helping anybody? Let me say this. I'm not going to finish this today. I'm not even going to try. But let me say this. One of the poorest ways to help the poor is to be poor. Just going to say that. One of the poorest ways to help the poor is for you to be poor. Has anyone here besides me ever been broke? I, anybody, I'm talking about real broke, like broker than Ten Commandments. Anybody in here ever been broke? Raise your hand about it. I'm not ashamed about it. I've been broke. I have been broke. I may be broke again, but it's not going to be because I took a vow to be broke. People who think because you're a Christian you should live in poverty is do not know the word of God. Here's what the King James Version says about being broke. It says, it stinketh. (laughs) And anybody who's ever been broke could agree with that. Can I get an amen? There's nothing in the Bible that says poverty is a blessing from the Lord. Adam, Adam and Eve woke up in Eden full of food, abundance, more than two people could ever handle. Nowhere in the Bible is poverty a blessing. And you can be broke and not be poor. Broke is a temporary financial condition. Poverty is a lens that sees only meager possibilities. And when you only see meager possibilities, you're going to limit God's ability to bless your life. The old saying is, tired eyes rarely see a bright future. And you don't get what you need, you get what you believe. If you got what you needed, Haiti would be flourishing. You don't get what you need, 
you get what you believe. Come on, can I get an amen about that? See, some of us don't have what we need because we're, we're not getting what we need. We get what we believe. God has called us to be stewards. So in order to steward, you've got to have something to steward. You've got to have something to watch over, something to take care of. And everything in the kingdom that is stewarded gets multiplied and increased. This is how you know that it's kingdom. If you steward it well, it grows. If poverty is from the Lord, then why did God bless Isaac so much that he became rich until the Bible says he became richer, and then the Bible says he became extremely wealthy? It doesn't say the devil did it. It says God did it. God bless Isaac. This is what the Bible says. So he became rich, then he became richer, and then he became extremely wealthy. If poverty is so spiritual, then why did Jesus tell us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? There's no poverty in heaven. There's no 30-year mortgages on those mansions. Come on. If money's so bad for us, then why doesn't Satan just pour a ton of money out on all of us and watch us backslide? Just common sense. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like why, why not? If money's so awful for us, you know, if money's so bad for us, then why didn't, you know, why doesn't Satan, you know, pour it out on all of us? Why did he take it away from Job? If, if, if God said, okay, to Satan, go ahead, and tempt, go ahead and tempt Job, why did he take money from Job? And why at the end of it does God bless Job with a double portion of it if it's bad for us? Why, if it's bad for us, then why does the Bible say a good man, how many of you want to be good men, leaves an inheritance to his children's children? Matthew 6, almost done, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And so many Christians are afraid um, of money, but God has called us to steward it. Money is not evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And how you avoid loving money is you keep putting God first. Amen? And you learn to live financially free when you turn your finances over to God. And material possessions are not a sign of God's blessings unless they are. There are some places in the Bible like Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and Solomon where the hand of the Lord's blessings caused them to prosper. The ark of the Lord went to Obed-Edom's house and he prospered and prospered and prospered. What happens when the presence of God came in his home? Everything increased. How many of you want the presence of God in your home? One person wants the presence of God in their home. Anybody else want the presence of God in your home? The presence of God in your home will cause your home to prosper. Look what it did for Obed-Edom. Everything in his home started prospering because the presence of God was there. It caused so much so, it caused King David to go, hold on a second. He got jealous wanted the Lord's presence back. He said, I'm going to take that back. What happens when the presence of God came into a house? It began to flourish. It began to prosper. This is what happens when the presence of God comes in our lives. Listen, it is not my job or your job to determine how much is enough for other people. You're not the prosperity police. No, I'm serious. Quit, quit trying to police what God has given other people. You don't know what those people have been through. You don't know what they've done. You don't know what, what sacrifice or, or, or pain or what God has done in their life. This is the great sin of presumption. 
do not do that to people. And, and I think all of us in this room can be guilty of that. I've been guilty of it. How many of you have ever been the prosperity police over somebody? You've seen somebody, oh my goodness, I can't believe they would. I would never. That's just out of control, blah, 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 blah. Here we go. It is not our job. It's not your call. God hasn't called you to do that. You know what my call is? To determine who has too much. You don't get to judge another man's harvest when you don't know what kind of seed they put in the ground. And love does not mean you have to be broke. And having money doesn't mean you're necessarily godly. Just because you got money don't mean you're godly. You guys are the mafia. (laughs) Here's the deal with money. Money is to the natural what the anointing is to the supernatural. It's simply a way to get things done. And we have to get this kingdom view of money because too many people are getting their self-worth from their net worth. It's a tool. Nobody's bragging about their shovel collection. Because it's a tool. Come on, can I get an amen about it? Look at my wrench set. Let me show you all my flathead screwdrivers. You understand? They're tools. That's what finances are. The kingdom view of finances are to accomplish purpose. Everybody say purpose. And that's what we're going to pray here in just a minute. We're going to pray for God's purpose on our finances. How many of you want God's purpose on your finances? God's purpose. Give me your purpose. And a part of that is taking care and blessing your family. That is, that is, that is a part of God's purpose for it. That, that you... Well, let's say it this way. What is more spiritual? Giving to the poor, tithing, taking your family on vacation. It's all of the above. It's all of the above. And depending on what the owner is telling you to do. Sometimes God says, hey, I want you to take this and I want you to give it to that family. Sometimes he's like, I want you to take your family on vacation. Come on, somebody say amen about that. This is why you've got to hear from the Lord. Yes, tithe. The tithe belongs to God, but, but what's left? God's going to tell you. Sell a portion of that over to this person. Hey, I want you to, to invest in this. I want you to take your family over here. Take them, take them on a vacation for a week. God, and this, this, is, this is, yeah, that's spiritual. Praise the Lord. Pastor said, oh, on vacation is spiritual. Wow. Yeah. As long as you don't miss Sundays. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> And this is the heart of God for our families, that we operate in our purpose. And I'm not going to finish that. I'm going to be done. But I'm praying that, that any fear that you have over finances that would be released in the name of Jesus. And the closer, hear me before we pray, the closer you get to the Lord, the less fear you'll have of finances. And God we, begins to give you a spirit of release. You can begin to put him first. You begin to tithe. Then God begins to speak to you about it. And then God begins to trust you with more. How many of you want God to trust you with more? So let's all pray that. Would you lift your hands and say this to Jesus? Say, Jesus, I now release all my fears over finances. I lay them at the foot of the cross. Give me purpose in all that I steward. Give me wisdom and divine strategy that everything I put my hands to would prosper. Bless this church. Bless all that we're doing for the work of the Lord. Bless the youth conference this week, Lord. And we ask for divine purpose and that we would prosper and be in good health as our soul prospers in Jesus' name.
Somebody say amen about that. Come on, give God a big praise. Amen. Hey, if this sermon blessed you and your family, I want to encourage you to be a truth partner. You can do that by simply going to creativechurch.com slash give and partnering with us to help get this message of truth out to more people in our nation and around the world. It is our truth partners that make this a reality. Again, thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thank you for liking today's video. We'll see you back here on the channel real soon.